Hello. It is the afternoon of the 28th, oh, 21st of August. It's a Friday. And I uh, woke up early and read uh, about eight or nine pages of chapter three of the book Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth, written by Stuart Holroyd. And we'll put all the details in the bottom. Uh, we had a bad signal this morning and I suddenly realised it wasn't going very well and um, then I decided to stop it. So I'll start a little bit earlier from where I stopped. I just listened to it. There was a little stoppage here and there. So I start from page 63, a change of channels. Uh, John had been talking about uh, his involvement with Anveja uh, and so on. Uh, you have to listen to the previous one to hear that. Page 63, a change of channels. During the week of the May lectures, John was tied down by his commitments to the guest speakers and was not able to get up to Mill Hill to participate in the communication held there. Transporting the lectures from the States had been a major item of expense and John was determined to make the most of the opportunities afforded by having these people simultaneously together in one place, despite the indifference of the press and the establishment. All week he was busy, introducing people to each other, discussing projects, attending meetings. PR work was something he didn't find particularly congenial and had to put a lot of effort into it. And at the end of these days he was immensely grateful for the response he found with Diana, an intimate friend for three years with whom he was staying in London. As Diana Bacchetti played an important part in our story later, played an important part in our story later. He may as well get the introduction over with at this stage. John had met Diana in 1971 at Esalen, the Growth Movement Institute at Big Sur, California. She had been there nearly two years at that time, dividing her time between Gestalt therapy training and working in the organic garden. John went to Esalen on a whim, drawn there by an article he had read in Time magazine in Switzerland where he had settled after selling his property in England. Neither his past personal successes nor his present jet set life had afforded him fulfillment, so he had gone to Esal in his search for alternatives. He became so enthused and zealous evangelic about the psychological growth work done there that he had engaged a Hollywood film crew to make a movie about it, which he had produced and directed himself and which, under the title Here Comes Everybody, had been shown at the 1972 Cannes Film Festival. It was during the making of the movie that this relationship with Diana had begun. On the whole, he had found the woman, the women at Azalen, with their drab and shapeless hippie clothes, their frizzy hair and tendency to, to skew feminine elegance on doctrinaire grounds as mere artifice belonging to an outmoded second sex way of thinking, totally unattractive. But Diana was different. She had a natural elegance, grace and dignity of bearing. They started spending a lot of time together. When his movie was completed, he asked on an impulse one day to quit Esalen and go with him to the Bahamas, where he had a house. She said he was crazy, but she went. They were, they were for eight weeks or nine weeks where they lived, worked and loved and developed new understanding of life, of work, of love and of each other, and cemented a relationship at depth which, like all such relationships, was so subjected to stresses and vicissitudes in the years to come. In 1973, John and Diana had attended a six-week course together at the California Institute of Psychosynthesis, Psychosynthesis, and it was here that Diana had discovered her vocation. She had gone on to take advanced training in the techniques of psychosynthesis and had been in London now for six months, working with a recently formed institute there. In June, she was going to Italy to work with Roberto Asaldilio, the founder of Psychosynthesis, who was Psychosynthesis, uh, who was now 86, and with whom she had struck up a close relationship, in which she figured as a kind of combination of daughter figure and beloved disciple. Her and John's commitment being so different, and each in its way demanding, meant that they didn't know from one month to the next when and for how long they would be able to be together. And the period of the preparation for and the presentation of the May lectures was the longest continuous period they'd had together in the past year. The scheduled program finished on Friday night, but then to some of the key people together for further discussions, John had arranged for about 15 of them to be house guests for the weekend at Orsett Hall in 
Essex. Bosset Hall was the ancient Whitmore family seat, and although no longer owned by John, it still boasted portraits of generations of Whitmores, all endowed with a prominent nose that still distinguishes their renegade descendants and which, to judge from the portraits, many of them used most effectively for looking down. John had been fortunate in finding as a purchaser for Orson Hall a close friend, Tony Morgan, with whom he was on such terms that he could still regard the place as his home in England. Tony had helped with the funding of the May lectures and he and his wife Val had generously offered to host the weekend house party to conclude the event. When John got down to Orset on the Saturday morning, most of the guests were already there and his party had not arrived, however, and the first thing Tony told him was that there was a message for him to phone Mill Hill as soon as he arrived. He did so and learned that events there had taken a dramatic turn. The previous evening, Andrija and Phyllis had worked with Bobby and, curious thing, and a curious thing had happened. They had just begun when Corian had asked them to leave the room but keep the tape recorder going because there was a message for Bobby alone. About half an hour later, Andrija had returned and taken Bobby out of a trance. He had tested the recording and found that there was a message on it in Bobby's trance voice. Bobby had then listened to this alone. Afterwards, all that he would say was that he wanted some time alone and that he would return to the stage soon. In view of this, Andre said, Andre just said he thought it, they thought to get together and have a communication as soon as possible, either at Mill Hill or at Osset. John agreed and suggested that Andrija and the others should come down to Osset, where they would be able to work in privacy at his mother's house at the Morgan home, with, because the Morgan home was now such a hive of activity. Andrija, Phyllis and Bobby arrived about two hours later and John allowed them a little time for cordialities before hustling them off to his mother's house on the other side of the village. Lyle Watson, Wat, Watson joined them because in a previous communication, Koran had said that he could, should be given an opportunity to participate in the work and had specifically instructed that he should listen to the tape of that communication. They set it in a bedroom and Andrija put Bobby through the trans induction preliminaries. Koran came through and began by drawing their attention to the fact that Lyle had not yet listened to the tape. So they interrupted the session for an hour to enable him to do so, leaving Bobby in trance. When they returned, Andrija asked Corinne to take the initiative in the discussion, and Corinne said, We only ask this at this time. There's much to be done. But it's not important that we discuss things until after Bobby's 30. We ask until 5th of June. We ask all of you to relate him to us, to release him to us until this time. They agreed and Corin confirmed that Bobby had been given directions as to what he should do in the private message of the previous day, adding that after the 30th birthday, they would all understand and know what was to be done with him. Was this a case of Bobby's interconscious securing for him a for, for, by subterfuge release? from a situation that had become intolerable? The thought occurred to John, but on reflection, he couldn't see that Korean could be just a function of Bobby's unconscious. There was too much in the communications that was inconsistent with such a theory. And besides, the theory was inconsistent with such a... And besides, the theory could not explain the undoubtedly paranormal energy effect produced in the abortive distant healing experience. distant healing experiment. There had been another and even weirder paranormal event recently involving Lyle. Lyle had received a letter from his parents in South Africa some days before, thanking him for sending them a copy of his will. This was odd because he had not made a will and hadn't sent any communication to his parents for some time. They had suggested several times that he should prepare, prepare a will, probably because he tended to live a dangerous life as a lone explorer and sailor but Lyle had not got around to doing so. In the earlier communications that they had just listened to, Andrea had asked, Andrea had asked whether Korean had anything to do with the mysterious appearance of, of, of the will. This is a question you can ask after all that has happened, Korean answered, and in reply to Phyllis' question, is Lyle one of us, had said yes. He's ready, but he's unsure of what he may do. I have the feeling that things have been arranged for me to be free at this time, Lyle said now. 
I have to choose a direction before the 18th of June, probably. Is there something I can do or should be doing? We only ask for a commitment at this time, Karim answered. It will be clear by his 30 to all of you. We do not ask anything else until then. So everything was still dependent on Bobby, and further work had to be held in abeyance until after the birthday that he still irrationally feared. That night, Bobby returned to London on the first stage of his journey back to Daytona Beach. Phyllis, too, would return to Florida in a few days' time, where she would be available, available if Bobby needed her, but would observe but would observe Korean's request to leave him alone until after the 5th of June. Little did any of them know at this time that 5th of June was to pass, and 18th of June, Bobby's birthday, to approach before any of them had heard from, from him again. Between them, John, Adrija, Phyllis, Loyal and Norman Sheely travelled some 12,000 miles to get together at Miami Airport on the 17th of June. When the expected sixth member of the party, Bobby, didn't turn up to join them for the onward flight to Georgetown in the Bahamas, they could hardly but wonder what they were doing incurring such expense and making such efforts for his sake. John suddenly wondered, for he was paying the travel expenses. The idea had been that they should all be with Bobby on his birthday in order to give him all the morale and emotional support he might need to get to it, and that the ideal place for the purpose would be John's house in the Bahamas. Bobby had agreed to the proposal and said he would meet them at Miami Airport, but it was a week since Phyllis had, been made, had made his arrangements with him and hadn't been able to contact him again since. She had spoken to his wife that morning and she had been in a panic because the last time she saw Bobby was three days ago when he had told her that he was going into the Everglades to work things out for himself. Phyllis had left messages for him all over the place confirming the time of the meeting at the airport and she kept hoping until the last minute that he would turn up. His failure to do so made the whole operation seem rather pointless and absurd but they were too deeply committed to the arrangements to change them. So they took their scheduled flights to, flight to Georgetown without Bobby, who, for all they knew, was still in the Everglades, the treacherous and infested swamp region of inland Florida. Stocking Island is a small island about a mile offshore from the larger Bahamian island of Great Exuma. Some years before, John had bought an unusual Spanish-style house perched on the rocky shore facing Georgetown on the main island. A young couple occupied and maintained the house when he was not there, which was most of the time, and they had prepared guest rooms and laid in supplies for the present visit. It was an idyllic place with palm trees and colourful bougainvilleas growing in the courtyard, and the guests expressed appropriate delight and admiration. But the unspoken question, what are we doing here, was all in their minds. John reflected that except for Lyle, one of his guests was person that in normal circumstances he would make a friend of and wonder how he was going to occupy them. In the evening they had barbecue dinner in the courtyard during which by tactic agreement they talked about other things that preoccupied them all. After dinner they went into the house and assembled in the living room to discuss what they should do. Korean, Andre Rido recalled, had promised that everything would be made clear to them after Bobby's birthday, which was tomorrow, so perhaps they should just wait and see what happened. Bobby might turn up on another flight. Phyllis said she wouldn't be surprised if he did, because the last time she'd spoken to him, he had really wanted to be with them at this time. It was unfortunate there wasn't a telephone on the island so that he could phone his wife again, that she could phone his wife again and give her number for Bobby to phone and leave a message if he wanted to. John suddenly had an idea. Phyllis was a medium, wasn't she? She could communicate with other dimensions. Why not see if one of the spirit controls give them any information about Bobby's whereabouts and well-being. It was worth trying, Andrita said, and Phyllis agreed to cooperate. She would have to wait an hour or so, though she said she, she never did trance work so soon after a meal. When an hour had passed, Phyllis said she was ready. Andrita set up equipment to record whatever transpired, and John doused the light. Doused, doused the light. Phyllis slowly counted down into a deep trance. Her body slumped, remained so for about two minutes. Then, gradually, straightened to the control when it took over. We are here, she said in a firm voice. I am Ryr, R-Y-R. This was an unexpected turn up. 
Rear was the name of the entity that had communicated through Phyllis during one of her classes, the message about the three of them coming together and forming a core around Bobby. During one of the sessions at Osing in April, they had ascertained that Rear and Korean worked in Korean worked in cooperation, so Rear was presumably not a spirit, but an extraterrestrial. Adrija asked about Bobby and promptly received the answer. He's defying, he's being defiant. We understand why it is the nature of his thinking, but we are all gathered and you are all gathered and we will be and pray with you. We are attempting to stop this testing. We are attempting to, to ease his burden. He will test us in the car tomorrow at three. A decision has been made among us that we must not interfere in the mechanics of the car because then he will do something of a more desperate nature. It is his, this nature that defies and dares that is also strong in releasing the energy that flows through. I have a feeling that he actually will put himself in a situation where he can get killed, Andre just said. And his reasoning is that he, that if he is really wanted and by the powers you present, we present, he will then be spared. And for, for, for him, that will be proved positive. That is right, we confirmed. But there was another aspect to the situation that Adrija's analysis omitted. Beside the test that he is despairing of, in his mind, he is positive that he has no value. He is positive that he will not only disturb, harm and destroy you. That has been his pattern in his past. He is not aware that this destruction nature can be utilized for your world. When the testing he does is finished and we pray it goes well, then he will have a glimpse of hope. The only way the assembled group could help at this time, Ria said, was by holding sessions of meditation, seated in a circle and sending him love. Our love, your love, can penetrate the iron that has bound himself, that he has bound himself in, Ria said. They agreed to meditate that night and the following day at the crucial hour of three, but the feeling of frustration at being able to do so to do no more than this, and at being so dependent as they were on Bobby for the continuation of their work, caused Andrejas to ask some questions that they had all entertained. Why was a person with so many weaknesses and instabilities as Bobby, as Bobby had chosen for this work? Why wasn't the opportunity to serve given to some other member of the group? Any one of them would be happy to take it on. We did not choose, they answered. He chose. He gave each and every one of you a chance to perform your service. All of you are here for service, but for some of you that service is necessary. He is one of those. He is also one of us. When we return to your physical world, we oftentimes forget the spiritual side of our makeup. You all have been in this position at one time or another, also evolved through progressing, processing. The work is not just our work, it is the work of the universe. All of you have served, all of you have evolved, it is now his chance, but if he should fail, there will be two of you that can carry on, and there will be more, because there are those that are waiting. This answer, which put Bobby's crisis in a universal context and gave, us, gave it a relevance beyond the merely personal, and which also assured then that whatever happened the work would go on at the time considerably alleviated their feelings of frustration and omnipotence and strengthened their resolve to continue to give bobby possible power but what would happen norman Sheely asked if bobby survived his crisis and decided no longer to participate in the work would the ch changes that had been affected in him be reversed we do not take back what we give Rhea said. John asked if that meant that Bobby would retain some of his healing ability and was given the answer, that is right, but it is tragic if that is so. In your experience with this type of opportunity, Andrit said, do you often run into this kind of testing with a tinge of destructiveness in it? Is this more the case than not? You are right, Rhea answered, but went on to make an inter interesting assertion. We are coming at a time, we are coming to a time when that will not be a factor. We are on the fringe. In the past and until this time, 
that type of energy which is compatible with this planet has only evolved to this point. You have new people that will not be so. Does this refer to some of these youngsters who have appeared all over the world recently with unusual powers? And which asked. This is what we speak of, said Rare. This was the first mention in the presentation of a subject that was to reoccur frequently in later ones. A number of other questions on various topics were put by members of the group and answered by Lear before the session concluded with a moving assurance and exhortation. The one thing that we know is that the work and the service will go on and we have the nucleus here. Know that and have joy within you. This is a heavy time, a troubled time, because we are as responsible as you. Only love, unselfish, non-possessive, pure, will bring this time into being from our side and yours. You must always share and love and be open with each other. This then creates an energy with which we can work. Well, it looks as if the cosmic connection is re-established, Andrija said when Phyllis came out of trance, and he summarized for her the content of the communication. There followed an animated discussion in which they shared their hopes and fears, their beliefs and doubts about the communication, and speculated about what Rear had meant about there being two amongst them who would be able to carry on if Bobby should fail. Presumably it meant that Phyllis would be able to serve as a channel, but Bobby was both a channel and a healer, so did it mean that healing powers would be developed in one of them? That was an intriguing question, but one that was impossible to answer. And anyway, Phyllis said, they shouldn't dwell too much on it at this stage, but should concentrate on all their efforts and thought energy on helping Bobby through his ordeal tomorrow. At three o'clock in the afternoon of the 18th of June, Bobby's birthday, they had all assembled in the courtyard and sat together in meditation for 15 minutes, as they had been instructed to do, trying to send Bobby psychic support and love in his hour of supreme crisis. Anxious to have news of what was happening to Bobby, they reassembled in the early evening for a communication. There are many of us here, was the first thing that Rio said when Phyllis was in trance. Apparently, there was a conference in progress in the other dimension, attended by Korean and other concerned parties, and Several times during the ensuing conversation, Rhea had to apologize for delays in responding, saying, I'm sorry, I was in another conference. Bobby, they learned, was alive. Since 10 o'clock that morning, he had been going through a crisis in which, in his mind, he tried every way to eliminate without eliminating his physical. This presumably meant that he had contemplated ways of suicide, but had not actually performed the act. With regard to his involvement in the work, however, he had made a decision, and it was in the negative. The decision of no was not what Bobby wanted, Rear explained, but he did what, in his confused mind, he considered the best for all parties involved. The Korean group thought that there was a possibility that they might be able to work upon Bobby to get him to reverse his decision, and to this day they were requesting, the Rear reported from the other conference, that they should be given a two-week extension. They seemed to attach a great deal of importance to being granted this extension by Adrija, John and the others, which, so far as the latter were concerned, presented no problem. But they discussed the question with a serious consonance with its alleged importance while Rhea stood by waiting for their decision, which they then announced was in the affirmative. Korean's petition, however, was apparently a more contentious matter in the other conference, for Rhea reported that their request for two weeks had been disallowed and they had been granted only ten days. Who by? they all wondered. And Andrija said, we'll, we'll go along with whatever decision is made. It's more important for us to help the soul than to be concerned about these arbitrary units of time. They could help, Rhea said, by sending Bobby a message assuring him of their support and that there would be a place for him in the work if he ever changed his mind. His function would not be the same as in the original plan after an alternative plan had been put in motion, but it was important for him to understand that the doorway was always open for him to return. And Richard promised that they would 
compose such a message and send it to public as soon as possible and we have said that it should be signed by the four of them. This reference to the four was interesting, for it seemed to indicate that Rear was aware of the commitment Lyle had entered into some weeks before in the communication with Collier held at office, and to include him in the nuclear group. It did not, however, include Norman Sheely, a pit participant in the May lectures, who had been sufficiently impressed by what he had been told to accept John's invitation to come to the Bahamas, to learn more about their work and possibly play a role in it. It was clear from the conversation that they had had that Norman was intrigued but highly skeptical and was concerned for his professional reputation, should he get more deeply involved. As a medical practitioner, practitioner he had already gone out on a limb by recommending the use of circuits in diagnosticians, and obviously if he went back to his peers and said he had been talk talk talking with space beings, he would be put well beyond the help, beyond the pale. He would put himself well beyond the pale. We have reviewed the outline of this new doctor, Rhea said when Andritya introduced Norman into the discussion. It is of a practical purpose, we understand, in your world. Probably relieved at not being asked to make a commitment to Norman about the purpose of Bobby's work as a healer. We explained that last evening, Rhea said. The decision was made a long time ago. I'm thinking more in terms of the purpose in the world, not for Bobby's soul, Norman said. The purpose of your civilization with its influence upon humanity. This is why Korean is being given special allowance, Ria said. And Arija elab elaborated, explaining to Norman about the work of preparing mankind for the landing. Well, if this is true, Norman said, then the main goal is to achieve as generalized a raising of consciousness as possible, is it not? You used the statement, if this is true, Iria admonished. If this is the purpose, is what I mean, Norman corrected. That is better, Ria said. Doctor, will you explain? And Richard explained that the general idea was that Bobby was to be used gradually, to win over the medical profession as part of an overall plan to prepare for the landing, then we drew the session to a close. You will bear with me, but I have been conversing in two spheres. We send you love, we send you blessings, we send you peace. We are pleased that you have decided to continue with us. We know of your problems, we know of your concerns. We do not have the density that you must deal with. We do not know, given the, uh, these, we, given the same conditions, if we could do what you must do in the world of denseness, we go in peace. When Phyllis came out of trance, she was disorientated and felt that something was wrong. She had been, she said, on a sort of big platform, suspended in space where there were a lot of being assembled and she had acted as an interpreter, receiving and transmitting messages that were conveyed telepathically. John assured her that what she said made sense in relation to the communication that they had just had and that there was nothing wrong. But Phyllis remained disquieted and said, It was a strange place. I don't remember ever being in a place like that before when, when I do this stuff. Something I don't understand is why they think this is so heavy for us, Leon said. Why do you think this is such a big thing we're doing for them? This led to a discussion of the characteristics of the communicators and the impressions that they had formed of them. They seem to be concerned that we want instant action, Norman said, and that if we don't get it, we will be disappointed. Yes, John said, I, I think that they may think that our capacity to change is considerably less than it is, or our capacity to, up to, to adapt to a plan. Perhaps it is in sense that their computers have limitations in adaptability and we have a greater degree of adaptability than they thought which would explain their surprise. I feel that they are learning a lesson, said Phyllis. Is it possible for their souls to grow more? Of course, for all souls, said Andrija. We tend to think of them as being godlike, but they're not, right? They insist on being equals. Yet, as John said, their computers were programmed in a certain way to read us, and they are surprised that we can actually operate as we're doing. It was a novel idea that they might have something to teach as well as much to learn from their extraterrestrial contacts. And the news about Bobby 
was a relief, if not exactly encouraging. They composed and signed a letter to him to mail the next day and retired for the night looking forward to their next communication with Rear, which Rear had said would be their convenience the following evening. They spent the next day for the first time since they had come to the island swimming, sailing and enjoying the sun and the sea. In the afternoon, John and Phyllis went to Georgetown and post of Phyllis, they went to the airport to meet the afternoon flight from Miami, but Bobby wasn't on it. They returned to the house for dinner and when enough time had elapsed after the meal to enable Phyllis to work, they assembled in the living room. John put out the lights and lit a candle and a mosquito coil. Mosquitoes were a problem, for the breeze had trapped, had dropped, and the air was still and heavy. There was scarcely a sound from the water which could usually be heard rhythmically slapping the coral a few feet from the house, and in the still air the sound of calypso music carried across the bay from the hotel on the main island. Phyllis went into trance and the communication began with Rear fussing about some technical problems saying we are attempting a new connection, we may need to adjust for fine tuning as we proceed. The energy field is strong, this being is now sensitive. We must turn down the volume, we every second control operation, but the heart is very rapid. Can you slow that down by just pressing the left cartoid sinus, Andre put in helpfully. We correct that and the force field becomes again oversensitive, said Ryan. But eventually the technical problems were overcome. The channel, they were given to understand, was wired with nine sonars or direct lines. And when the bioengineering was completed, Rear announced, we are prepared to work as long as necessary. Reporting a mobby state of mind, Rear informed them that he is in his heart with you. A decision in his heart has been made, but he is on the surface being deceptive. He must face and be honest with that condition. He is bright because he is bright because of decision, but surrounds himself with dark because of still looking for the easy path. Bobby should be left alone for ten days and then would be time to approach him and to plan and to decide whether he could still play his part in the plan. The plan had been that Bobby would have been a catalyst, the switch that would throw a light into your world, that would have been the master switch. But, Rear said, any good program or organization must have alternative courses of action in readiness and proceeded to expound a concept that was completely new to everyone. Future healing work, they were told, would be done by pairs or even groups of healers working together and there were two people in the present group who could form such a team. The energy principle involved in channeled healing was difficult to explain in present circumstances because this brain, Phyllis, has not the words. But Rhea urged, you will be patient to attempt. A thing they had learned through working in the physical world was the necessity of balancing the polarities of male and female energies. For when a subject is not balanced, the energy can be turned inwards and it can then create a problem. But with the balancing of polarity, the flow stays and strengthens in a positive manner. In the past, many healing channels had been burnt out because the importance of this balancing of polarized energy had not been fully appreciated. There were in every individual both types of energy, the male and the female, or positive and negative but always one was predominant and in order for the flow to function, the energy flow we speak of, in order for it not to destroy, blow out or burn out the cha channel, you must blend the female and male energy. This did not imply, Rear was careful to, the point, to point out, apparently on instruction from above, they say I must be clear. A male female physical re this did not imply no 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 from above. They must they must say a male female physical relationship, but only a relationship between types of energy. I must clarify. We speak not of the physical, we speak of the etheric. 
You speak of the energy that flows through each of you. There's an envelope of energy around you. If, for example, a female is used to transmit the energy that we send in healing without a balance, we would not be able to continue using that vehicle for a great length of time. But if we work and blend in pairs, if one male is used and the energy is transmitted through the female, if they work in conjunction, it is purified. It operates similar to a cheesecloth. It filters out and clarifies and creates a pure energy. Such a conjunction, Adia further explained, was not always necessary. Many human beings had the capacity to generate a certain amount of healing energy within themselves. But it was necessary for major healing work in which an external source was tap tapped. In such work, what was required was a balance and blending of male and female energies, or more specifically, of two etheric bodies, one male and the other female, in order to form a kind of lens through which the healing energy would be channeled from its extraterrestrial or other dimensional source. Or, to use another metaphor, the female would work as a plug and the male as a switch, or it would be reversed. Of the people in the room, the two who were attuned to work together as a team were Phyllis and Lyle. The plan for the next stage of the work was to go on with the happening of many people. And this would be the task of Phyllis and Lyle, working in conjunction if they agreed to undertake it. The primary reason for Bobby, Rear said, was to make your professional people aware. But the long-term program was to open many people, particularly amongst the young, as channels. The young can be trained, but they must be opened by using a male and female polarity. The blended and balanced energy of loyal and Phyllis etheric bodies could open and blend the energies of others so that we can then use those beings to transmit healing through. The above paragraph condense information that was elicited by questioning in the course of an unusually long communication. This was a key communication, not only because it divulged new information and plans, but also because it brought into focus certain biases of attitude towards the work which were later to become both more prominent and more disruptive. Andridge's bias was towards obtaining the maximum possible information about the science, the technology, the, the, the way healing and channeling worked, whereas John and Lyle were more interested in the overall program and purpose. We're trying to find out what the nature of the energy is, said Andridge. Is there any way of giving us a hint? Is there a true science of polarity? Could you give us an elementary exposition of that science? What would opening up mean to the person who was opened? What would they experience? What would they feel? What would their motivations be? Rhea tried to cope with his barrage of questions but said, I have difficulty with this brain and said, loyal becoming impatient, said, and Richard, I think we can get bogged down in detail. John agreed and suggested they should proceed with a general overall plan and get back to the necessity details later. The doctor is unhappy yet, Leah observed, and Andrija replied, Well, I would like to know what the science behind this is. This conflict of priority between concern for knowing on the one hand and for being and doing on the other was to become more acute in later work. When Rhea finally got round to outlining the tentative future program, Lyle was disconcerted rather than pleased by the offer of so prominent a role in it. Up to the present, he had been quite comfortable in his position as an objective observer. He'd said he was willing to participate in the work, but he'd had in mind that his contribution would be as an interpreter or a reporter, and the invitation to take on a more involved role caught him off guard. I can well understand how he felt, having a similar experience myself. The communication ended abruptly with Rio saying, We have created because of the force, a problem. We must completely disconnect. And suggesting that they might resume after half rest, Phyllis came out of trance, moaning and showed symptoms of intense physical pain. 
and when she regained normal consciousness her expression was fearful. Her eyes darted about as if she was following the movement of more objects or entities invisible to the others. It was some time before she spoke, but eventually she turned to Andritja and asked him, Are you sure we are dealing with the right people? She had felt threatened, she said, on coming out of a trance by some creature with black masks. John felt that Andritja was less reassuring than he might have been, and he told Phyllis he was certain she had nothing to fear, but when the half hour had elapsed, Phyllis was reluctant to go into trance again, and she was only prevailed upon to do so sometime after she had smoked several cigarettes. Contact with Rhea was not re-established, however. So the communication that ensued was not a continuation, but a new beginning. It was the beginning, in fact, of a new stage in Phyllis's channeling, for it was now that Tom took over from Rhea at her control. I have worked with this being before. We have been in contact many years, said Tom on his first attempt. John noticed that Phyllis's trance voice was changed. It was softer, more flowing, less mechanical than staccato. Would you please announce to all present here, can hear, can hear your name? Andrita said, and the reply came, My name is not important, but I am known as Tom. The being, Tom said, believed that he was a spirit and had been allowed to think so over the many years that he had worked with her. Tom, where do you come from in this universe? Andrija asked. We come from beyond your knowledge of light, Tom answered. We come from the zone you would call cold. He was with Korean, as was Ria, but Ria was a computer, and the difference between himself and the beings he represented and Ria was that we are with soul, explaining at Anrija's request what had happened in the last session. Tom said that Phyllis had feared that she perhaps was working with a computer and that she had had a into the new system that was being tried out. We were in error, he admitted, but the fault had also been with them, the participants. There were many negative vibrations that were then able to pull in other negative forces. It takes but one negative force to create the energy, energy with which the negative can work. There were many negatives in this room. We had in this room the negativity of Dr. Sheely, who in his own fears of his past was creating a negative storm. We had with you, Doctor, the frustrations of trying to have clarification, which created another negative form. We had with Dr. Watson the feeling that he was being threatened. This too created another negative storm. When negativity breeds, it creates a force like a hurricane or a tornado in your world. We terminate it. This analysis of the underlying tensions and on conflicts of the last session showed impressive insight, particularly with regard to Loyo, who had not at that time confessed to anyone his feeling of being threatened by the new role he had been invited to play. Tom went on to assure him that he was not being put under any duress, but he was simply being offered an opportunity to serve in a particular way. There would be other opportunities, other ways, if he chose not to accept the offered role. And Phyllis would find another working partner, for she was a catalyst in conjunction with many different male polarities. Lyle could take his time to reach a decision. Probably feeling rather left out and possibly a little piqued by the reference to the negativity of Dr. Sheely, Norman asked if he would have a part to play in the work. It depends on where your commitment lies, sir, Tom told him. Norman said that his commitment was to open up the channels within medicine, but that he had to keep busy and make a living. Tom said that he could be involved in the work in a way in that case. But his commitment should be to his work in medicine, for when this project is put into motion, there must be a total commitment, because there will be no energies for anything else. In the rest of the communication, and one held the following day, Tom went on to give fuller details of the nature of the project referred to, and the information he gave corresponded with and elaborated on which 
already received from Korean through Bobby's channeling. The main purpose of all the work being done on Earth at the present time by various extraterrestrial groups in conjunction with human individuals and groups was to prepare mankind for the landing. It was their hope that by the time of their appearance, 25% of the people would have been prepared for the event. We speak only of what you call your civilized countries, Tom said. The primitives will already know. Under Ja Phyllis and John were the nucleus of a group which would be given the fullest and most detailed information. For they had in Phyllis a unique channel for information transfer. And one of their functions would be to disseminate that information. At the extraterrestrial level, there were different units at work with different skills and special interests, and the work of these units was gradually being correlated. There was one unit, for instance, that was now working on the technology of interfering with television transmissions and projecting their own material onto television screens. As this was considered a good way of de demonstrating their existence to a large number of people at once. The present group would continue to be involved in the area of healing, but it was important that they should always remember that they were the primary hub of a worldwide plan and organization established for the purpose of making the world aware of the existence of extraterrestrial civilization and of their benevolent concern for the world, so that they should not be opposed when the time came for the landing. We have the technology to help your people, Tom said. It is very difficult for us to help them when we are being denied that we exist. And it's going to need our technology in order for them to survive. Need I say more? The process of expanding human awareness had in fact already begun. On the 16th of October 1971, a new situation and a new era in Earth history had begun. Since then, Tom said, and you are aware of this, Dr. Watson, yourself included, have become more aware. Lyle replied that the date of 16th October 1971 was very relevant to him, for it was on that day that he had sat down to write his book, Supernature. It was also John's 34th birthday, and about a month after this day, Andridge had begun his research with Yuri Geller. Work had been steadily progressing on several fronts since 1971, Tom said, but now the time had come for it to be accelerated. The worldwide emergence, in the wake of Geller, of children with paranormal powers was a sign of this acceleration, and there would be more, so there would be more such children whose powers would become manifest in various ways, for instance, in an ability to put animals into a sleep-like calm condition just by touching them. Your world is becoming more open to the work that has been, that we have worked many thousands of years, many eons, to bring into focus. The we in the context included present human company. You have worked on many planets doing what you are doing now, Tom told them. Moreover, Bobby had been a part of their group in other incarnations, and there had been a time when he had been instrumental in putting the rest of the group through circumstances of crisis caused by their own errors. This time it was their turn to bring Bobby through and they should continue to try but should not be too distressed if they failed. In his past five lives on the planet Earth, Bobby had failed to accomplish what he needed to do and if he failed again, he would have other opportunities. There was always a high failure rate with beings who had chosen to be in service while incarnated on planet Earth. Because of the physical nature of the planet and its seductions, and in fact only 2% of people who returned to serve actually centered, entered upon a commitment. There had, been, there, had, there had been a problem with the Earth for thousands of years. There was reason to hope, though, that with the new age, consciousness developing, there would be many more that would commit themselves to the work that was necessary for survival. As the doctor, the being, as Phyllis is referred to throughout the communications, and Sir John had committed themselves, and as Dr. Watson 
was now invited to do as what was now invited to do. It was clear that the sessions was drawing to a close, so John said, asked about future communications. The group would be leaving the Bahamas the following day and dispersing to various parts of the world, and he wondered whether it was possible for them to communicate individually, perhaps by using other channels. His question elicited another piece of unexpected information. You can make contact with us by going into a meditative state. Being aware of your left ear and being aware of a force around it and an inspirational thought around it. At times we try to inspire you and to help you and many times I speak to all of you. You are confused and do not understand that it is our thoughts that we are transferring to you and anytime you need reassurance or feel depressed or feel you need contact, go into a meditative state and ask for us to come. You will impress through your left ear the answer you need to know. Every one of you has been wired in your left ear. I hope you speak in English, not in Morse code or something unreacher equipped. <laughs> we go in peace, we send you love, we surround you with protection. We wish you to know we are always with you. When he finally took his leave. And had been... How long is this? It had been, they all agreed, when they were talking after Phyllis emerged from trance, a very impressive and fascinating communication. Indeed, the entire Bahamas trip, Bahamian trip, which had begun so uncompromisingly, had turned into, unpromisingly, had turned into an experience none of them would easily forget. The following morning they flew to Miami together and then dispersed. Phyllis and Adretta to return to their homes in Orlando and Ossin in Norman to his clinic in Wisconsin, John to join, Di John to join Diana in Italy, and Lars to take back with him to London. Certainly, the strangest and possibly the most important dilemma he had ever confronted with in his life, ever been confronted with in his life. Except for Norman, they all agreed to get together again in a month's time at Ostinin, unless the management, as Phyllis now jokingly referred, named their communicators, summoned them to a meeting earlier. A publisher friend, in a letter declining the present book, wrote to me, If the Austinning experience turns out to be illusory or a hoax, then the tone of earnest inquiry in which it is described will be entirely inappropriate, seems to me. I see this point, and I have chosen to take the risk of adopting in, relating, in relation to the materials an attitude of serious. I would not say earnest, which suggests humorous. humorous. <laughs> Inquiry precisely because I am satisfied that it is neither illusionary nor a hoax. I have participated in enough communications now and I have not I've got to know the people involved well enough to be satisfied on this point. I'm not saying that John and Adrija may not be wrong in believing that they are conversing with extraterrestrials, but to be wrong is not necessarily to be deluded. And I'm satisfied that these are sane and serious men whose claims deserve to be taken seriously instead of being peremptorily derided. Derision is often the recourse of the mediocre minds when they are confronted with novelty. Such minds seek comfort and safety by huddling together and it seems to me that an uncritically derisive huddle is not more admirable, though it may be safer, than an uncritically credulous one. So I make no apologies for asking the communications seriously and trying to assess them intelligently. In the period covered by the narrative so far, there are three things that are particularly impressive. One, the thematic consistency of the communications. Two, evidence of supernatural recognition. And three, paranormal physical phenomena. Let us consider these in turn. Thematic consistency. In the communications held between March and June 1974, there were two distinct channels, Bobby and Phil, and three different communicators identified themselves Korean, Rio and Tom. Yet the information channeled contained no contradictions or anomalies, anomaly, anomalies. But on the contrary, in respect of a number of themes, it followed a process of development with internal consistency through coming through different channels, although coming through different channels and allegedly from different sources. We are given to understand that Korean, Rio and Tom 
are in communication amongst themselves and the consistency of the information they've given supports this proposition. For instance, the theme of the landing was introduced by Coran in the first communication held. Coran also stated that the function of Bobby and of the group around him was to make mankind aware of the existence of other civilizations in order to prepare for the landing and that there were other groups working on this prospect in other ways, project in other ways. These points were reiterated by Rear and by Tom, who added the information that one of the purposes of the landing was to give mankind advanced technology, technologies that would help ensure the survival of the planet and also that a new age consciousness that was better adapted to the planet's future scenario had been spontaneously developing among a minority of human beings. The theme of previous incarnations of John, Andrija, Phyllis and Bobby was mentioned by all three communicators. He was with you before, said Karian of Bobby on the 14th of March and in the communication of June 22nd, Tom said, you have worked on many planets doing what you're doing now and explained how Bobby had helped the rest of them through a crisis on a previous occasion. So let me see how my, I don't know how my, I hope I have my, enough battery. Healing and the energies involved in healing were subjects on which each of the communications had information to contribute. We are sending very, we, are, we, are, we were sending very strong, said Korean after the abortive demonstration to the May Lecture Assembly and re explained how the healing, how the sending takes place through the blending of male and female energies in the etheric, creating a kind of lens. From the start, Kuril had said that Bobby and Phyllis should work together as a healing team, and Ria gave the rationale behind this recommendation, expounding the theme of the balancing of polarities and the need for a process of filtering and refinement. Bioengineering in another, in, is another reoccurring theme. I suppose we have to accept that beings capable of intergalactic travel might possess other kinds of neurotechnological expertise, expertise incom incomprehensible to us. But all the talk in the communications, a lot of which I have admitted in my, uh, in my writings, about sonars, implants and wiring, is the bit I find most difficult to take. But it, but it consistency argues for plausibility. But, but if consistency argues for plausibility, I suppose we have to suppress our natural repugnance for the idea of being messed about with biologically and concede bioengineering as much credence as we choose to give to the other reoccurring themes. For all three communicators talk about this. In a final session held in the Bahamas, Andrija asked Tom how they reconciled their bioengineering work with their repeated statement that they never interfere with free will, referring particularly to the implants that were supposed to confer paranormal powers on, for, on certain children. Tom replied, it does not impinge on their free will as it was their decision at the time of birth, which is a clever answer and one consistent with the claim that such children are incarnated souls from other civilizations. Thematic consistency and the fact that enlarged upon coherently with different channels and different alleged communicators certainly constitutes prima facie evidence that the information is not generated by any individual intelligence, human spirits or extraterrestrials, but exists independently of any such intelligence and under certain circumstances becomes accessible. I shall discuss this point at greater length later, but now let's go on to the second impressive characteristic of the communications re reviewed up to now. Evidence of supernatural cognition. A century of physical research has established to the satisfaction of all but the most invenerate skeptics that telepathy, clairvoyance and precognition occur. As these are proven human faculties, evidence for the occurrence in the present context does not necessarily imply that the communicators communications came from an external source though the circumstances of the occurrence in some cases do seem more consistent with this hypothesis than with the alternative one that the information was obtained psychically by the medium. For instance, in the Arsinian communication of 8th of April, Korean reproached Phyllis and Andrija 
while not giving a message to Bobby, as they had been asked to do the previous night. The fact that Korea knew that the message had not been delivered is significant, for it is unlikely that the knowledge would come from Bobby, who was in a trance and supported to be the recipient of the message, or from the, sis or from the sitters, and Richer or Phyllis, for they were being admonished for forgetting to give it. Korean explanation of the cause of the failure of the demonstration healing is a similar case to the above. After listening again to the instructions for the demonstration given in an earlier communication, Phyllis and Andreja suggested two reasons for their failure, but omitted the main one, which was that Bobby had metal in his pocket and on his clothing, a fact which neither of them knew. Bobby presumably knew that he had coins in his pocket, but he was in a trance, and the very fact that he had the coins implies that in his normal state of consciousness, he had no recall of his trance under utterances. Will's response to Bobby's actual state of being throughout the time of the group were at John's uh, house on Stocking Island were later found to be quite correct. Bobby had contemplated various means of suicide, including an automobile by automobile ex his birthday. He had resolved to withdraw from the work, but at depth, he was still undecided and struggling with his problem of confidence. Of course, Phyllis, knowing Bobby well by now, might have been able to make an intelligent guess as to how he would feel and act, or she may be capable, like the seer, Edgar Case, of trans clairvoyance of a distant person's physical and mental condition. So the fact that Rio's reports were true does not prove Rio's existence as an independent mind, though it does, not, it, it does strongly suggest the operation of a paranormal cognition. Finally, Tom's insight into the causes of the negativity that disrupted the last session with Rio, and particularly into Loyal's feeling of being threatened by the role it was proposed he should play, is impressive evidence, for no one had anticipated that Lyle would be offered such a role, and he'd had no time to tell anyone how he felt about it. Paranormal physical phenomena. The most incredible part of Andridge's account of his work with Yuri is the record of numerous materializations, dematerializations, psychokinetic and teleportation events. And I'm sure many readers of this book felt, if he wants me to take him seriously, I wish he wouldn't ask me to believe all this stuff. The present narrative raises the same problem. What are we to make of the story of the miraculous burn healing or the blow out of the transformer that terminated the attempted demonstration in London? Witness as to both events, about 60 to the second of them, vouch that they happened, and although for most of the hum us humans, mendacity is a common experience, that physical paranormality is a poor reason for dismissing them as lies. The attitude Reality must be such and such, because I've never experienced it otherwise than such and such. It's not only unphilosophical, but fundamentally unintelligent. The cry, not of the truth seeker, but of the man who seeks the fixation of belief. In later chapters I shall be reporting other incredible physical phenomena, and I confess that this is the part of the story that causes me most unease. Although it work, I have now experienced one or two things myself that had rather eroded my scepticism. With our Western scientific rationalist culturist background, which has been dominated which has been dominated for the last three centuries by the principles and methods of physical science, we find paranormal mental phenomena easier to deal with than paranormal physical phenomena. We are readier to concede that tele telepathy or Clairvoyance, clairvoyance might occur, then materialization and deeper materialization. We are ready to concede. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a cultural bias, and we ought to recognize it as such, even if we can, can or don't want to transcend it. Western science has been so stupendously successful in fathoming the laws and harnessing the power of the physical world that it cannot give credence to anything that apparently subverts known laws or manifests a power that it has not harvested yet. Such considerations may help us some come to terms with paranormal physical events, but they do not help us to understand what such events might signify. 
In point of fact, some contemporary theoretical physicists may, might find physical power normally, power normally, physical paranormality easier to accept than does the man in the street, for the events resemble quantum events on a macroscopic scale. It is interesting and perhaps relevant to note that physicists working in the field of superconductors and superfluids, the physics of very low temperatures, have observed quantum events occur on a macroscopic scale. And to remember that Tom's answer to Andrita's question, where do you come from in this vast universe, was, we come from beyond your knowledge of light. We come from the zone that you would call cold. But this is to embark upon a subject that could have a chapter to itself and which I shall return to later when we have more time to discuss. For the present, I just want to leave the reader with a question whether the internal thematic consistency of the communications, the evidence for supernatural, for supernormal cognition within them, and the occurrence of paranormal physical events in connection with them, constitute convincing or even prima facie evidence that the communications are what they purport to be. It is not necessary, however, to come to a decision about this at the present stage, for there is a great deal more of the story to tell. So, that was the end of chapter 3, the second part. It was a long chapter. And the chapter 4 is called Exits. I wish you all a very good Friday night. I enjoyed that. Story good. Ha <laughs> ha.